Okay, is it on? Yes, it is. So thanks, Lorenzo, for the introduction and also for the invitation. And of course, thanks to the other organizers for uh, putting on this nice thematic program. And uh, I'm thoroughly enjoying myself this week. It's also my first uh, in-person talk since the, the pandemic. So uh, I'm doubly happy to be here today. So this is joint work with uh, Björn Sprung, whom many of you know, and who, who's also going to be participating in one of these workshops. Uh, he's in Freiberg, and Alois Pichler, who's a, a colleague of mine at the math department in Chemnitz, he is, he's from uh, financial math. And we were talking about this at lunch today, how there are many communities uh, which have been concerned with uncertainty quantification for a long time, much longer than, than we have probably before it became a thing. And among these are the people from finance. And in particular, they've been worried about risks uh, as long as, as they can remember. And Alois in particular, he's, he's an expert on something called risk measures. We're gonna call them risk functionals in this talk because the word measure is a little bit um, overused and they, they can be viewed as, as a, a type of post-processing for, for uncertainty quantification. And I was surprised uh, that they hadn't caught on all that much in, in the UQ world. You see a little bit of them in, um, in, in optimization in the area called risk-averse optimization. But overall, I think they're an extremely useful tool and they sort of fit it in with what we were uh, thinking about. And so this is how this, this work came about. Um, so we're not, there's no numerics in this talk and uh, no, no approximations, more of a, a basic um, putting things together and to, to motivate what we're doing, uh, we're gonna come back to uncertainty propagation. So we'll think of a generic PDE. We're of course gonna uh, talk about our famous favorite model problem later on, but um, this, uh, as we realized as the work went on, is, is, is a fairly general approach. So think of a solution space, U, so the solutions of the PDE are going to be the little U's living in some space, and you'll have some data, some parameters. We're just going to call them coefficients. They're going to be uh, A living in a space, A, and the P PDE will just... Uh, in a very abstract way summarize as f of u comma a equals zero. Now you can stick all kinds of things in a, it can be a whole bunch of parameters, it can be boundary conditions, coefficients, forcing terms, and we'll just summarize everything into a. And of course our running example is going to be the elliptic diffusion equation. Um, to make it more interesting, we'll have the, uh, the log normal type dependence on a random field a. Otherwise, of course, a lot of other things could be random, but to, to keep it simple, we'll just have a, a Dirichlet boundary condition and everything else deterministic. And in this case, of course, uh, the solution space U is going to be H10. And the, um, the data space is going to be L infinity of, of the domain D. And of course, so the 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 problem we're going to be considering is, um, uh, well, uh, I mean, this is sort of a meta problem. Uh, it, it's hard enough to, to figure out what, what your coefficients are in a deterministic problem, but if you've uh, decided on uh, the fact that your, your coefficient is going to be uncertain and you're going to model it probabilistically, it's even more difficult to get the information you need about the probability distribution because the probability distribution is a much more complicated object. So often the diffusion or log diffusion in this case is not precisely known. And the way that everybody approaches this is that you, or most everybody, that you model this uh, uncertainty by placing a probability measure, which we'll call mu, on the set of, of, of the data set or the parameter set A. And of course, the question is, how do we obtain mu? We often, we're not we're uncertain about what the uncertainty is really like. And um, what we really want then, once we've fixed this uncertainty or this probability measure on the inputs is the resulting probability distribution, which we'll call nu, on the, on, uh, which is a probability measure 
on the function space, the space of solutions, uh, the distribution of our random solution U. And of course, uh, typically you don't want the whole field, you want some quantities of interest, uh, which are functionals uh, defined on the solution space or a subspace. And we're gonna call these little Q as in quantity. And well, you've probably seen this picture a couple of times before. This is the basic idea. We have an input distribution. Uh, the output will be the, the push forward measure as figured prominently, prominently in Amir's talk yesterday uh, by the solution map of the PDE. And since um, you don't really know the, typically you don't really know the the input distribution or have to expect that you only have the input distribution vaguely. Um, common you know, typical ways of getting this are statistical estimation techniques. If you have data, subjective knowledge, or there are systematic ways of eliciting expert opinion, but it's all very, it's, it's not a very exact science or maybe uh, the statistical part is, but the rest certainly isn't. And even the statistical part uh, will have, will have errors. And the idea, of course, is that if you have a different distribution of the input, you're gonna get a different distribution of the output. And so the question is, uh, can we control the effect of the perturbations of the input measure mu on the output measure? Okay, and this, this is where, of course, uncertainty propagation comes in. Uh, we're doing nothing but propagating a probability measure through a solution map, and so we'll give it a name. So we'll call the solution map, which takes um, data, input random fields and maps them to the solution of the random PDE, uh, S as in solution. And so, uh, as I said, the distribution of the random solution, new, is simply going to be the push forward measure, uh, usually denoted by a little star at the, at the bottom. Uh, so S is the mapping, and this is the push forward measure under the mapping mu, uh, under the mapping S of mu. And it's of course defined for if you have any measurable set U on the solution space, you just take the pre-image and measure that with respect to mu, and that's the push forward measure. Okay, and what, what kind of properties uh, can you often exploit for solution maps? Uh, we're going to be looking at local Lipschitz continuity. So uh, usually you don't have global, so we'll only uh, assume a local Lipschitz property. So the idea is to, to restrict the size of the coefficients. So we'll take uh, this some kind of a norm in A. You can also set this all in metric spaces bounded by some, some radius r. And uh, if you choose the two coefficients a and a tilde from this ball, their dis the distance of their corresponding solutions is bounded by this Lipschitz constant uh, times the distance of these two guys. And of course, uh, the Lipschitz constant will in general uh, increase with, with the radius. Okay, and the question is, if you do have a Lipschitz continuity of the solution map, does this translate to a Lipschitz continuity in uh, the translation of the measures? And coming back to, the, to our running example, the elliptic diffusion problem. Um, here, this is all standard uh, PDE lore. So if you have two solutions, U and U tilde, coming from two different uh, diffusion coefficients, A and A tilde, standard elliptic a priori estimates will, or, or continuous dependence on the data estimates will give you a bound like this. So something that depends on the right-hand side and it's easy to get a bound that's exponential in the radius. And here, of course, we measure a and A tilde in, in the L infinity norm. So this is a, a typical standard estimate you could easily get for say the, um, the elliptic diffusion problem. Okay, so first question, how do you measure distances for probability measures? Um, there's actually, uh, there, there are tons 
of distances. There's sometimes called statistical distances. There's a nice book by Rachev uh, on, on measure theory who lists about 70 different uh, distance types for probability measures. So there's one for almost every day in the year. So um, we'll begin with something very simple, total variation, because it's, well, it's, it's a nice introductory example. It's not very useful, but it's easy. So, um, and it is topologically equivalent to, to the Hellinger distance, which does play a bit of a role, say, in, in Bayes and inverse problems. That's often where in the, in the topology in which, in which content, um, uh, well-posedness is, is, is analyzed. Okay, so the total variation distance between two measures mu and mu tilde is just the largest distance that mu and mu tilde uh, can have from each other on any measurable set. Okay, and um, and it, this is a, a one-liner here. So if you take uh, any solution map, and here you don't even need to require uh, Lipschitz. Uh, measurability is, is enough. So S just has to be measurable from A to U, and you immediately get global Lipschitz continuity um, for the mapping from mu to the push forward. And so that the TV distance between the push forward measures is bounded Lipschitz constant one by the TV distance of the, the input measures. Um, like I said, proof is a one liner. Um, so this is the distance you want to bound. Um, this is simply the supremum of all measurable sets as defined. And this is simply the supremum overall um, sets in the sigma algebra generated by S. And this is bounded by the right-hand side here. So this is, this is quite easy. And of course, um, if you're interested in uh, um, quantities of interest, um, if, if they're measurable, the same rationale, of course, applies here. And you have stability. So if your input measures are close in TV distance, then your output measures and your quantities of interest will also be um, close, or the distribution rather of a quantity of interest will also be close in TV distance. Okay, um, but TV distance, as, as many of you will know, uh, is, is of limited use, especially if you're talking about PDEs, if you're working in, in infinite dimensional spaces. Um, why is that? Uh, a very easy example uh, are, are Gaussian measures, say on, on, on Hilbert spaces or on separable Banach spaces. Um, if you take um, two Gaussian measures, uh, let's say one is, has mean M and covariance operator C, and the other one is exactly the same except that you've shifted the mean by, by some, some vector H. And um, unless H is a very, very special vector, unless H is in this range of the covariance operator to the one half, the so-called Kammerer and Martin space, uh, that distance is gonna be one. And so almost all Gaussian measures, even if they have the same covariance operator are gonna be one apart. So it's not a very useful measure for measuring distances. And you, you have similar problems if you, if you don't even perturb the mean, but say you have two different covariance operators uh, like the Matern family and you perturb some of their hyperparameters, you're also gonna get a distance of one. So uh, TV is, is as, as nice as it is, it, it, it's not the ideal choice for, for measuring perturbations in, in, in infinite dimensional spaces. Yes. Just one clarification here, you're talking about random field. So if I have a random field with uh, mean M and covariance operator C and another random field with mean M plus H and covariance C, right? Actually, um, it's, it's, it's a different thing whether you're talking about the measures or the random variables, right? Okay. So we're talking, actually, this is a step more abstract. Um, okay. uh, random variables can have the same distribution and still be have have a, have a distance where their distributions are close. Okay, okay. Yeah. So this, these are actually measures, Gaussian measures on some dimensional spaces, not, not individual random variables. Okay, so um, here's where Wasserstein comes in. 
So we're going to consider uh, what's called the P-Wasserstein distance, uh, denoted WP, uh, between two, two measures. And this has this nice characterization. So you need two things. You need a distance on the image space to which the random variables map. Uh, here we just have some, some, some normed linear space. You can also do this in more abstract spaces, metric spaces, polar spaces. And here we'll just have these norms. So you've got the distance um, in norm between a random variable x and x tilde in expectation. And um, one of these random variables x has, is distributed according to mu, and x tilde is distributed according to the other one. And you take the infimum of all pairs um, and these are so-called couplings, and it, in, in this sense, it's more general than looking at individual random variables because you're looking at all the possible couplings between uh, joint distributions where the marginals are one and the other, which 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 uh, covers all possible dependence regimes between random variables which have these marginals. Okay, so it's this, and this infimum characterization is actually quite nice when you're doing estimates because any any um, distance for two fixed random variables will be an upper bound on, on the distance, on the Wasserstein distance. And uh, P is anything larger or equal to one. So that's Wasserstein. And some of the advantages of, of the Wasserstein distance, for example, um, yeah, like we had the, the mutually singular Gaussian measures, uh, same thing goes for, for Dirac measures. So these are, if A is not equal to A tilde, of course, mutually singular, uh, but the Wasserstein distance is defined and it, it even uh, returns something sensible, namely the distance of the two uh, vectors where the, the, the measures are concentrated. And this has been said yesterday, it generalizes the concept of optimal transport, the earth moving business. So you're looking for a map from A to A, A to A. Uh, such that uh, the push forward measure minimizes the transport cost. Um, duality theory plays a big role in the analysis of these of these measures. And uh, for example, for the Wasserstein one distance, there's this Kantorovich Rubinstein duality, which allows us to characterize. Um, I don't know where this H is coming from. This shouldn't be there. Um, so the distance between uh, two measures, mu and mu h, as, as a supremum of expectations. So, and the expectation, it, one is with respect to mu, the other with respect to mu tilde, applied to a function f, and you're taking the supremum over all functions f, uh, real valued functions on, on the space A, where the measure is defined, uh, who are Lipschitz continuous and have a Lipschitz constant uh, bounded by one. So this is also often useful for, for estimating Wasserstein distances. And there's a whole bunch of other properties. Um, yeah, I, I guess we don't we need to go into now. Okay, and so um, first result um, is a, a simple case. Assume that you have a, a global Lipschitz bound on the solution map S. Huh? So lip, lip S, Lipschitz constant global for the solution. And um, yeah, then immediately you also get uh, Lipschitz continuity of the push forward in a Wasserstein P distance uh, for any probability measures mu and mu tilde on A. All you need is global Lipschitz continuity and it holds for all Wasserstein distances. And the proof is also quite simple. I won't repeat it here, but um, it's essentially based on the characterization of Wasserstein distance by extremal couplings and a simple change of variables in the expectation integral and, and then you're done. So this is, this is easy. And um, I guess there aren't that many situations, at least with regard to PDEs where you can use it. Uh, if you want to go back to our, our model problem, um, if S is bounded and linear, it works. So for example, if you don't have the log diffusion uh, random, but the right-hand mm -hmm. side, then the solution depends linearly on, on the right-hand side. Or um, if, um, if either A or the support of the measures is bounded, uh, you also can get a global Lipschitz constant 
So for the solution map. So, um, but of course, often uh, in many interesting cases, you only have a local Lipschitz continuity. Okay, so if the forward map is only locally Lipschitz, we can't expect global Lipschitz continuity of the push forward in P of Wasserstein. Um, and this already holds in very, very simple uh, context. So uh, if you have real valued random variables, real valued Gaussians, one mu standard normal and the other mu tilde, well, this H keeps coming up here. Oh, this is, yeah, this now it's called mu H because of the H here. I have a, a mean H rather than uh, mean zero. And both have variance one. And there's an explicit formula for uh, the Wasserstein distance of, of exponentials, uh, of, of, of Gaussians. And the distance is actually um, just H, no? the difference in, in the expectation. So this, this uh, is known. And, um, so that's the distance between the, the input measures. And if you take as the solution map, which by which you want to propagate these measures as the exponential function, that's not um, globally Lipschitz, then you can use this uh, kantorovich rubinstein duality. Um, so to characterize the one Wasserstein distance between the propagated mu and mu tilde. So this representation as the supremum over all, well, one Lipschitz functions, in this case from R to R, of the push forward measures um, under the expectation of F under the push forward measures. And of course, just by definition, this is just the composition, and you have mu and mu tilde here. and um, you can bound this by um, just um, the expectation of S, and um, you can show that this is using um, the, the known formulas for the mean and the variance of, of log normal distributions. You can show that this is equal to square root of E times one minus E to the H. So um, you can bound the one Wasserstein distance uh, of these two measures below by this term. And therefore, uh, if you look at Wasserstein P of the push forward uh, versus Wasserstein P of the input measures, um, you have the same relation for different values of P here as you do for the LP spaces for bounded measures. So W1 is always less or equal to WP. For W1, we have this distance, uh, WP of the input was H. And if you let H go to infinity, this will blow up. So that means in this case, in this extremely simple case, you have a, a non-locally Lipschitz map and you don't have um, Lipschitz continuity of the Wasserstein distance of the push forwards. So um, you need something more. Uh, this will, you can expect this to work. Yes. I guess S, but S is not uh, globally Lipschitz. Yes, S was just the exponential, right? And the W1 is a supremum of our globally Lipschitz functions, I mean, with the Lipschitz constant one. Uh, this is where we started out, right? I'm oh, no, sorry, okay. No. Have the, uh, no, I, I should have, yeah, I should have probably put all the equations on. Sorry, yeah, yeah, just keep telling, yeah. Okay. And so what, what can we show? Um, the good news is that um, you, you can show something uh, if the, the uh, solution map is only locally Lipschitz. So uh, exactly what you want. So this is a local Lipschitz con uh, constant that depends on R. A and A tilde are both bounded by R. Uh, the bad news is that you get extra conditions on, on the measures. And what you need are these um, integrability conditions on um, the two measures. And so these are Lipschitz constant as a function of the radius to the power 2p. That's just what comes out. And if you do have this, um, so under the assumption uh, local Lipschitz for the push forward, um, you actually do get uh, Lipschitz continuity of the with respect to P Wasserstein distance of the push forward with respect to the originals. Um, but you move from P 
e to 2p here. This is a result of the cauchy schwarz inequality. You can play around with Hilda inequalities and massage this a little bit, but um, you do lose something when you go here. Okay, so what about the strange integrability condition? Um, is, this, is this severe or, or is it easy to, to um, satisfy? So what type of measures will satisfy this? Um, um, if you have, you know, like in the model problem, in the model elliptic diffusion problem, if you have a Lipschitz constant that blows up in an exponential way. Um, well, we'll go back to our favorite problem, uh, Gaussian random fields as diffusion coefficients. And so, yeah, this is a typical setup for a log normal problem. You have a random field A, with, which has a mean function M of X, two point covariance function uh, C of X, Y. And so the random field will be Gaussian with this mean and this continuous two point covariance function. And um, well, 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 we'll look at the Materan family as, as covariance functions. I guess most people are familiar with this family of covariance, two point covariance functions. They're very useful because they have these three parameters so that you can tune your, your covariance uh, in, in many directions. Uh, there's a, a global sort of amplitude parameter here, which says how large the covariance is at, at any point. The autocovariance, uh, if you set this equal to one, then uh, the covariance is one for x equals y. Then you've got the smoothness. Um, so I have this funny uh, half integer value because in that case, you can write this in terms of exponentials and polynomials. Otherwise you'll have these Bessel functions floating around. And um, yeah, correlation length. And uh, here's a couple of pictures if, if anyone hasn't seen this. So this is um, K equals zero. So that smoothness uh, zero plus a half. Uh, so you see, this is very rough. The trajectories here, this is in 1D, are very rough. And if you move from k equals zero to k equals one, so the smoothness 1.5, uh, you see the realizations are much smoother. And uh, here are two realization sets for different values of the correlation length row. So you see that um, the, the change, the changes here, uh, occur at closer distances than if you have a, a longer correlation length. So these are very popular for, for modeling uh, random fields, um, uh, particular Gaussian random fields. Okay, and so those are the ones that we're going to look at because they're, they're, they're so popular. And we'd like to uh, construct um, sets of Gaussian random fields for which we can satisfy this integrability condition, okay? And well, what we'll do, uh, we'll consider subclasses of these Gaussian distributions on the space of continuous functions. So we'll say um, G is the set of all um, Gaussian random fields uh, where, where the mean comes from a family of means and uh, the covariance comes from a family of covariance functions. The means will simply be uh, those whose uh, uniform norm is bounded by uh, a radius Rm. And the covariance uh, comes from, will be all Materan covariances whose uh, variance parameter is bounded above, correlation length is bounded below, and um, smoothness index is bounded by some k max. So some set of uh, Matern covariance functions, which you deem to be reasonable for your problem. And um, this is where it actually gets difficult. Um, and you have to sort of dig deep into the uh, measure theory toolkit. And we used all kinds of um, yeah, stuff. Fernique's theorem, the so-called Borel TIS inequality and Dudley's entropy bound. And uh, we came up with a uniform bound. I mean, you can, for, for one simple, one single, uh, uh, Gaussian distribution, Fernique's theorem will give you integrability. But what you want is, is something that's uniform across the entire class of, of, of Gaussian measures that you're considering. And so if uh, G is this uh, family of Gaussian measures, then for any beta, you can 
um, you have this um, bound here. And of course, that means um, if your solution map, assume now um, you've got continuous um, input realizations, it's locally Lipschitz with a um, Lipschitz constant, which grows exponentially, then for any such subclass, we do have a, a uniform bound such that we again have um, Lipschitz continuity in Wasserstein distance of the forward map. Yeah. I have a question here. I was expecting the three parameters that define the class G to pop up in the theorem, right? I mean, you say, okay, I want, I need. Uh, it's just, well, it just it says there's a uniform bound. Uh, that's all. Okay, so regardless of how. to see how the, how the, the, the parameters flow, go into the bound? I mean, uh, one, I was maybe expecting that there was a limitation on the roughness, for instance, right? So you said, if you go back one slide. Oh, well, the thing is, uh, as soon as you you fix this somewhere. You just exactly, so I, I, I would say maybe the raw mean comes up. If, you are, if your raw mean is too low, then you don't have control on the vast standard distance. I don't know. Oh, it just has to be fine. And, and and then, then, it, then it's great. I mean, <laughs> because it means that. It's even better than one might expect because it means that no matter how rough it is, okay. you can always. It just says this is finite. I mean, okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Thank nothing you. more. Okay. Yeah. Good. And of course, now if you want to, you can apply this to the log normal model problem. Uh, you pick uh, a log diffusion from the Matern family if you tune the parameters, and things will work out. Um, another, of course common thing that appears uh, is uh, in estimating or, or perturbing the input probability is um, assume you, you know it exactly, but for computational reasons, you truncate uh, a linear series expansion uh, of, of the input field or, or of a input field. Um, so Karun and Lev is one example, but of course you can use many. So if you have here, just this linear expansion in terms of some basis functions, FM, uncorrelated random variables here, uh, they have mean zero. Um, if you use KL, you'll get this. Um, if you use any, any Parseval frame, you'll also get this with, with, with other functions. So there are many ways of getting these linear. Uh, and of course, for KL, these are the square roots of the eigenvalues of the covariance operator. Okay, and um, so what's the Wasserstein distance from F if I truncate after M terms? And so if you, if you use the L2 norm, then um, Wasserstein P distance, this is again, this infimum characterization. So this is one of these couplings. And um, this is one way to express it. And if for P equals two, this distance is exactly the sum over the neglected um, coefficients here. And there's a result by Gelbrich that says, if, uh, if this is a Gaussian field, so this doesn't have to be a Gaussian field, but if you have a Gaussian field, then you actually have equality here. Um, what about um, more general situations? Let's say you're in a Banach space, you're in Lfinity, you have a linear expansion of the log diffusion. And um, you can get similar bounds uh, for the Wasserstein distance, for example, and under some conditions on these random variables. You can get this bound by just taking absolute values and norms of the neglected terms uh, for the one Wasserstein distance under the uh, assumptions that the expectations of all these coefficient random variables are uniformly bounded, and you get bounds on the Wasserstein p distance um, if you have almost sure boundedness of these uh, coefficients here. And the nice thing about um, Wasserstein, again, uh, there are a bunch of LP bounds of um, distance of truncated to original uh, series representations. For example, uh, Julia Charrier has some in her paper. You can immediately use those to translate these to Wasserstein bounds on the underlying measures. Okay, uh, I, I wanted to add something about risk functionals. Um, wh wh what are they? Um, so these are just, um, so if you have a quantity of interest, uh, assigning a number to um, uh, 
the solution of the PDE, then these are just random variables, right? Random um, quantities of interest. And um, let's say you have the complete distribution of the scalar quantity of interest. And it was said yesterday in Amir's talk, then you have the complete statistical information once you have the CDF state. But of course, um, this you know, takes us to the interface of applications. If you, if you have um, the, the, the complete statistics of, this, uh, of the um, quantity of interest, you still don't have a description of what, what the uncertainty will mean, what the impact of these uh, uncertain outcomes will be. And this is, this is where risk functionals come in. So um, what they do is they assign real numbers. We we'll call them rho, rho of x, uh, if x is a real valued random variable. And the objective is um, that they quantify the risk associated with the random outcomes, whatever that means. So here are some examples. Um, the simplest risk value is simply the expectation. So if you say the risk associated with a random variable is its expectation, uh, this is uh, called risk neutrality. You don't care about the ramifications of possible deviations from the expected value, like, like you know, the famous wading through a river, uh, which is on average three feet deep. Um, you, you, you don't, you're not as concerned with it. The other extreme uh, is, is maximal risk aversion. And then you assign the, the supremum of all possible values. And that's just the worst case. This is very, very safe, but essentially you can't really do anything interesting if, you, if, that's, if that's your measure. Uh, what's uh, gained some notoriety is, is uh, the value at risk. Uh, this is simply um, the, the quantile function. So if fx denotes the CDF of the random variable f and uh, x, and you take uh, an alpha uh, uh, confidence level uh, between zero and one, this is just uh, the quantile function of alpha. Huh? And let's see, there's also the average value of risk. Uh, this integrates what you've left out here. Uh, so from alpha to one, of the, of the quantile function. And there's a more general family called spectral risk functionals uh, where you do a similar integration, but you integrate over the entire zero one interval. You introduce a weight function, which assigns weights to different quantiles. Uh, this has to integrate to one. And for example, if you take a step function, which is zero between zero and alpha, you recover the uh, average value at risk. And if you have a delta at alpha, you recover the value at risk. So the spectral risk functionals uh, collect a whole bunch of other risk functionals. And here's a sort of an illustration. Um, let's say you have a, a density function here and you pick an alpha and you say, well, I, I, I'll, I'll pick this value as my risk measure uh, where uh, the alpha quantile of the probability mass lies below. That would give me this value at risk. And so in, in that sense, uh, you're simply ignoring everything in the tail, in the right tail of the, of the density. Uh, so um, of course, you do have the confidence, let's say alpha percent of the mass is to the left. Uh, but of course, these may be high consequence events here in the tail and you're completely ignoring them. So this conditional value at risk or average value at risk uh, will average over the over the tail, and at least, and and and, it's, and this is always larger than the standard value of risk. Okay, and what the question is: If you have these risk functionals which uh, quantify the risk, um, how do these depend on the input measure or the the distribution of u, and ultimately on the input measure? So in the PDF context, you'll have. Your, your random parameters, you have a solution map taking you to the solution of the PDE, then you apply your quantity of interest and you end up with a real valued random variable to which then you apply these risk functionals. And um, there are a bunch of, there's an axiomatic uh, description of the family of risk functionals, which at least by financial analysts, uh, that every risk functional should have. These are called coherent risk functionals. They've been around for over 20 years. And these are properties and they, they're, they're, you know, they make, make a lot of sense. So there's this monotonicity. If, if uh, one random variable is almost surely less than the other, then the associated risk should also be less. 
Translation equivariance, uh, if you subtract the number, then you can move this outside. What does this mean? Let's say you have a portfolio and you take um, money C out of it and you um, allocate it into a riskless asset, then you've reduced your risk exactly by this quantity. Subadditivity is very important. Um, if you have two risky uh, propositions, then the risk associated with their sum should be less or equal to, to the individual risks. So this is, uh, opens the possibility of hedging and positive homogeneity. If you scale something by lambda, you scale the risk by lambda. And um, if you follow the discussion about the financial crisis, value at risk was, was used uh, by regulators to tell banks how much reserve capital to allocate for in the event that loans go bad. Um, and value at risk is actually not, not sub, sub additive and, and it's not one of these coherent risk measures. And there's all kinds of criticisms that basing risk decisions on value at risk uh, will allow risky behavior. Okay, so um, I'm running short on time, so I'll be brief here. Again, there's a lot of convex analysis here. Uh, there's a very clever representation of risk measures or risk functionals by the Fenchel Moreau duality theorem. So you can express a risk measure as a supremum uh, over dual variables, H. These are also random variables. And they come from a set, which is a subset of the dual uh, called the support set of this. And you can design these um, support sets to generate essentially any risk measures. Uh, essentially, you can think of these as, as densities, which uh, uh, um, weight the different worst case outcomes for the risk measures. And um, so the question is, how sensitive is a risk functional uh, depend to the underlying measure? And we were able to show that for holder continuous risk quantities, um, for any coherent risk functional, we again um, have a Hilder type. Oh, this time not. Lastly, we formulated all the other uh, Lipschitz results in terms of Hilder, and here we have the Hilder formulation. So this are, these are the risk functionals of the quantities of interest of the solution, and you can bound it in terms of the Wasserstein distance in a Hilder fashion um, of, the, of the underlying input measures new and new tilde. And so if you put everything together in terms of solution maps, if you have a Hilda continuous quantity of interest, local Lipschitz solution map, and you can take any risk measure from the family of spectral risk measures, um, and then you get um, a Hilder bound of, of everything coming so push forward of the input measures down to the risk functionals of the solution with respect to the push forwards. And you can again bound it in terms of the, the input measures. Okay, um, running out of time, I just wanted to plug. Uh, There's at least six minutes. Oh, I thought I had only 40, good. Um, you may have, but we started late, so. I, I can talk slower. I just wanted to, to plug uh, some results that Jan Sprung had. So he has a, an interest in, in Bayes and inverse problems. And I think this has all been said uh, before. So you have the usual UQ approach to inverse problems. Um, you have again, A containing the, the input measure and you have now data. So you're mapping it to K measurement points. You might have some Gaussian noise Epsilon, so this is essentially just a solution map composed with an observation operator. And the objective is to update a prior measure for an uncertain input A. Think again of log diffusivity, if you like. And you condition uh, the, the prior measure on data according to Bayes' rule, which we've seen a couple of times before. And it's well known that uh, Bayesian formulations of inverse problems are well opposed in the sense that 
um, you have a local Lipschitz dependence of mu phi, mu phi is the posterior distribution um, on data. Yeah? So on, on, on the observations. And of course, there's also the question is uh, if, if, you, if you screw up in the choice of the prior, how sensitive is the posterior on, on your choice of the prior? Exactly the same kind of question as for uh, the propagation. And so well, with some, some simplifications, because I don't want to tell you everything, um, but there's, a, there's some nice results that Bjorn has. Uh, so if, if D, so this is uh, formulated in terms of metrics, but if D is one of the TV, Hellinger, one Wasserstein, or KL divergence, so a whole bunch of uh, statistical distances, um, you again have a local Lipschitz continuity of uh, posterior measure in terms of the prior measures. So at least there's this fundamental type of continuity at work, but, um, and this is, this is uh, fundamental to, to Bayesian problems. Um, this constant here will blow up uh, as the data become more informative, that is, as the noise decreases, as the, when the uh, posterior is, is, is more concentrated, then, then this constant will deteriorate. Um, okay, so um, this is about it. So what, what have we uh, achieved here? So we have local Lipschitz sensitivity or uncertainty propagation with respect to Wasserstein and also T TV, although it's not very useful, or forward maps, which are locally Lipschitz. Uh, as I mentioned, the same proofs give uh, Hilder uh, estimates uh, rather than simply Lipschitz. Um, we've used also in the paper the, the, the log diffusion, or the random diffusion equation as a running example. But of course, uh, as soon as you can verify the assumptions, it will hold for essentially any forward map. So there's the potential of applying it also to other PDE type problems. Um, we also have it, uh, the, the Hilda sensitivity for risk functionals. And um, there are similar results uh, for sensitivity of Bayesian inversion with respect to the choice of prior or also perturbations of the likelihood. And so there are essentially two papers where you can read about all this stuff. This first one is set to appear in SIAM Journal of UQ and Bjorn's paper has already in inverse problems. So uh, I'll end here and, and thank you for your attention.